Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the October 23rd meeting of the Bellingham City Council. I'd like to call this meeting to order and first an announcement. On Monday, November 13th, here at 7 o'clock in the Council Chambers, there will be a public hearing on the City of Bellingham's 2017-2018 mid-biennium budget adjustment. That's basically our, our budget hearing for the year or for the next year. Will you please now all join me in saying the Pledge of Allegiance. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Roll call. April Barker. Here. Dan Hamill. Here. Jean Knudsen. Here. Michael Lilliquist. Here. Roxanne Murphy. Here. Pinky Vargas. Here. Terry Borneman. Here. Okay, we'll go to our regular business. We have two public hearings. We'll hear them first. After public hearings, we'll go to our 15-minute public comment period, which you may have signed up for. Before that, I'll be calling people forward for each of the public hearings. So hopefully you signed up to the right sign-in sheet. If you didn't, we can just fix it as we go along, and I'll open up the floor to anyone on a public hearing, even if you didn't sign up. Our first public hearing is a public hearing to consider an ordinance related to land use, planning, and zoning for adoption of the Watkin Community College Institutional Master Plan, including comprehensive plan and Bellingham Municipal Code amendments and rezones. And uh, we will have Mr. Brian Keeley from Watkin Community College here to present. Should we go ahead and start with you, Mr. Keeley? Okay. Good evening, council members. My name is Brian Keeley, and I am here on behalf of Whatcom Community College leadership to request that the city council uh, adopt our master plan that we've created into the city comprehensive plan. <clears throat> I'm joined tonight by Nate Langstrott, who is our VP for admin services and uh, Keith Schreiber with Schreiber, Starling, and Whitehead Architects, who was the, the consultant that helped us with our master plan. <clears throat> I'm gonna talk a little bit about the why we developed a master plan, and I'll be brief because I know you all have had the packet and reviewed that. Our goal with the master plan, um, the primary goal was to, su to support the college mission and core themes and vision and strategic plan through a planned physical development of our campus. <clears throat> the purpose for the, for the master plan for the college is really threefold. One is to identify and define uh, future space and infrastructure needs, uh, providing a framework for decision making to accommodate change and long term growth. Another is to support the biennial funding requests to the state capital um, budget requests that, that fund our state capital projects and also help support um, other funding strategies like grants and private partnerships and so forth. So that is a very important piece for us. And then the third is to, of course, meet the requirements of the City of Bellingham Municipal Code 2040 which basically requires any entity or, or institution within the city limits owning over 50 acres to have a master plan. The process for us started back in 2012 and um, has been a very educational process for me and I think all of us that were involved. Um, we wanted to make sure that our master plan was closely connected to our strategic plan and really fell in line with the same goals that were outlined in the strategic plan. We went through a process of meeting with on-campus stakeholders and uh, as well as our, so that, that kind of in, included our campus faculty staff, uh, leadership, our students were a primary part of that. And then we also reached out to our community, um, the neighboring community and uh, did some planning with them as well. And through that process, we gathered a lot of information, kind of identified some needs on campus, some priorities for us. 
We also coordinated with the city to understand what the requirements or the format for the, for the master plan would be and uh, how they, what kind of supporting documents would be required uh, for the master plan. And then we did a lot of studies, uh, gathered data, uh, things like uh, traffic studies, comprehensive stormwater plans, wetland delineation, those types of things that help us understand our development picture on campus. And then we put all of that information together and, and um, tried to come up with identifying some of our needs. And through that process, we, we really identified that we had a, a significant need for general classroom space, more general classroom space based on our growth on campus. Computer labs were in a shortage, and science labs, as it turns out, are a shortage as well. We need more study and gathering space, study space for students, both quiet and collaborative study space. Um, we have a need, we feel, to improve our north-south campus connection. Our, our campus is divided by um, Kellogg Road currently, so that's a real important piece of it for us. We want to make sure we have a good pedestrian connection with WTA, the new WTA station. Our students rely on bus transit um, very frequently, so that's important. Student housing became a need, uh, identified need. And then just some general conference spaces, smaller seminar classrooms, and then some of the space, growth space for specific programs. So what we're asking for, most of our, most of our campus was already in, zoned institutional. We did have some commercial and industrial zoned areas that we're trying to um, rezone with this master plan process to institutional. Aside from the obvious academic um, uses under the institutional zoning, we also have things like support, administrative support, residential, student activity space, open spaces, mixed use, public utilities, wireless communication, and other uh, accessory uses that are going to be or would be allowed under that type of zoning. So I just, I, Put a, three slides in here that kind of show the first one is our near-term um, development plan and we've already actually started on this plan uh, you can see that we're showing the number two uh, project there is our learning commons which we had hoped to start this this summer but we have not received our capital budget yet so we did not get going on that yet um, and then there are a couple, we're showing student housing off to the east side of campus, number four in that, in that image, and then some improvements out by the, our soccer field. Looking a little farther ahead, um, we have an extension to Kelly Hall, which is actually a project that we're in the process of requesting state capital for right now, um, for next biennium. Uh, we're also showing um, an extension or an addition to our health profession center that's actually located uh, just off of Stewart Road to the north of campus. And some, some remodel and renovation to Cascade Hall and Heiner and possibly Laidlaw Center. And then our far-term development plan shows um, some additional conference space, that number 10 there, that is a conference center and then some tie-in with um, hopefully local business and industry for some professional technical buildings and off to the south of campus some administrative support and academic spaces. So that's really what I kind of wanted to show you. Um, I know it was brief but um, I wanted to thank you all for allowing us the opportunity to present tonight and hopefully uh, you've had a chance to review our IMP and, and the information that was provided in your packets and uh, hopefully you will agree that it's a good plan and we can include that in the city comprehensive plan. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Would staff like to say any comments first? No, thank you. Okay, Councilman, Just for the questions. Real quick, sir, uh, you mentioned student housing. How many units in that number four? 
We're, we're, the feasibility study that we did identified about 225 beds. My goodness, that is great. And that is um, primarily to support our international program, but also a lot of our, our athletes and um, even you know some of our domestic students prefer to live on or near campus. That's great. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Any more questions before we open the public hearing? If I might, we do have a staff presentation. As you oh. recall from the hearing examiner, we're trying to allow proponents to go first and then to follow. You still get your turn? We're hopeful. <laughs> we're very succinct. Thank you. I'm Kim Wheel. I'm a planner with the city planning department and Chris Cook, my colleague, is from the planning department and he's going to go through the slides as I speak very briefly. Um, about the proposal, which is the institutional master plan. It's a culmination of good, good work, long work, many years in the making. Um, and I think that the city and the uh, community college worked really well together. A lot of heavy lifting because there was lots of parts and pieces, which um, we'll talk about very br briefly tonight. If you want to go to the next slide. Um, I've been the project manager, but I have certainly only managed the expertise that has contributed to this. And some other colleagues are here tonight. If you have any questions, specific questions, I think they, they can answer them for you. So I'm just going to go through the basics of the project and then spotlight some things that might be of special interest or concern to you, as we identified earlier. And at the end of it, we'll ask for your approval of this proposal. Well, Whatcom Community College has grown a lot over the 50 years, so they've exceeded the 50 acres, which as our BMC requires, to, um, they need to have an institutional master plan. And that map, and you'll see some in the next slides, shows the boundary of the, uh, of the IMP. One of the nice things about the IMP is that it's going to be a lot more efficient for development review. And um, not only that, but it will help them with their state funding, as Brian mentioned. Excuse me. So the IMP boundary is that area on, overlaid on that 2016 aerial photo. And there's a couple little areas, if, I think you can see them in little black and white dashed lines. Those are the areas that are proposed for expa future expansion, potential future expansion. They're not owned by the college right now. So if you see it, kind of an odd boundary, that, that explains that a little bit. They are not going to be expanding into residential areas. That's one thing that people asked about. These boundaries are for their future over the next 25 years of growth. So these are, are the boundaries. Although they started a, as a college without walls, I don't know if you read that, um, they do actually have some boundaries to this IMP. And as I said, there was lots of parts and pieces. The required amendments to the comp plan, to the, the rezones that we'll show you in a moment, and the Billingham Municipal Code. Uh, the structure of the new code, the 204100 that we call Article 1, is a nice new framework for future IMPs so that when Western or St. Joe's comes back with updates to their IMP, we have a new framework that will make that nice consistency for users and um, interpreters of, of the code. The Meridian zoning map, uh, we updated both the zoning map and the land use map, and it, you, you can see that uh, one Part of Area 25 that's now zoned commercial will be rezoned to institutional. It'll remain in the Meridian neighborhood, but it is, um, that's where the student ho proposed student housing would be. And that'll be Area 36. And then in the Cordata neighborhood, the changes are uh, two small changes. Areas 15, two small areas in Area 15 zoned commercial will be rezoned to institutional. They're used as institutional right now for Whatcom Community College. Then the, the districts, this is, uh, Chris was really helpful. He's worked a lot on the Western Washington University IMP, so we brought some of those concepts and uh, over to this IMP, including districts. And all the uses that Brian mentioned are allowed in all the districts, but the districts are kind of just, they have common features, so they're described as districts one through, one through three, and with district two being where that proposed student housing would be. The purpose of the IMP is a little bit different than for uh, the city's purpose anyway, is a little different than Whatcoms, but it's, it's very well aligned. Um, obviously we need to define the boundaries so we know what the limits are of this 
potential growth or for the growth. And um, he talked about the phase development. It includes um, elements of phasing for that future growth. We need to make sure it's compatible with the land there and that it works well within the neighborhood. And um, we also need to make sure that there's adequate sewer and water and other utilities. So the implementation is, we're kind of excited about this. Again, it's, it mimics what Western does. And there's two tiers of development, or two paths, I guess. And one is, for significant projects, they would go through a site plan approval process. Um, there are not very many, not many of the projects will fall in that category, but that will be um, compared against the new BMC and the institutional master plan. The other path is it would just be simply a building permit review, which will be most of the projects. Again, making sure there's consistency with those other elements. And Cordata Design Review Committee will continue to be involved as they will need to make sure there's consistency with the private covenants. One of the bigger changes um, in this proposal is it takes the Cordata PUD out of the zoning table and out of the more regulatory realm and into the advisory realm. So the BMC that I just mentioned, Article 1, the new institutional code, replaces that. We worked with the Cordata PUD. They are in favor of this change. Uh, we incorporated a lot of their design elements, or design standards, rather, into the BMC, and they're very, very compatible. They, they're very supportive of this change, as, um, as are other people in the neighborhood, because the PUD is largely built out. And so the relevance of them as the authority is, is, is changing. Other details, the height limit is flexible, except for those areas that abut residential, neighbor, residential zoning, rather. Um, so we've got some flexibility there for the campus. Brian mentioned studies that have been done. The IMP does identify when future studies might be done, depending on the phasing of the development and the intensity. Um, this next two, we'll show you on the next slide, this future traffic, excuse me, uh, the connection, potential connection, thank you, between that area that might be student housing that was commercial, is you know, right up against commercial, so there are some recommendations, no, not rec there are requirements for when that District 2 is developed to make a connection, pedestrian and vehicle connection between West Kellogg to the north and Short Street to the south. And one other detail uh, that's not on the slide is the gross square, gross square foot footage of the gross square floor area, excuse me, of um, in the IMP is 500,000 uh, gross square feet. And the student housing does not count toward that. So there's an incentive to have some really efficient land use there without the height flexibility, without the height limit and um, without it counting against that. And uh, this is a slide with lots of BMCs, but basically we've, the IMP is consistent with all the update requirements, all the code requirements. It's also supported by the um, 2016 comp plan goals and policies um, that Whatcom Community College growth is supported. Uh, an environmental review was done. And, uh, in the next slide, the, there's been a lot of interaction with the neighborhood. I give, uh, we give Whatcom Community College a lot of credit for reaching out to their neighbors and stakeholders. And um, we've done the same through our, our process of notifying the neighbors. And we have one comment in the packet, one written comment. Um, the comments we heard at the Planning Commission had to do mostly with Concerns about expanding the, expanding the boundary, which we assured people that that is not going to happen without another similar process, and um, with with traffic. And so the planning commission recommended approval of all those elements: the comprehensive plan update, the rezones, and the adoption of the new BMC. And uh, tonight, your role, I um, I guess, we'll move right to the last bullet. We hope that you will. We ask that you approve the Planning Commission's recommendation and adopt the IMP. And uh, we have numerous staff here for questions. 
we can answer now or wait till the public hearing. Okay, and just for those who may not know, BMC stands for Bellingham Municipal Code. It's just our laws. Council members, any questions from about the staff? Okay, uh, should we go ahead and move straight to the public hearing? Chris, could you see if there's anybody signed up to speak to the hearing on the Whatcom Community College's Institutional Master Plan? Okay, nobody has signed up, but I'll go ahead and open up the floor, the microphone. If anyone would like to come forward and speak to uh, the issue of the Institutional Master Plan, now's your time. Okay, just come forward and state your name for the record. Hello, my name's Kurt Thor, and my wife Sue Thor is here. And we, we own a commercial property right next door to where this residential um, development is proposed. And we're just, uh, it's, it's right next to Short Street, it's Blossom Commons development. And um, so we're just concerned about, we didn't get a packet, you talked about a packet and us answering some, was it a questionnaire that you were handing out? Though so I don't know if we received that. I think she means the council packet here, which okay. is a copy of the I IMP it draft itself. Okay, I think and she sent something out to neighbors yeah. that were in concern over anything. That's what I thought it was. But anyway, um, so we're just concerned about Short Street and the traffic flow, um, if that's going to be the access for the residential part, because it's, it's uh, pretty busy right there. So that's, that's just my concern about that. We haven't heard, you know, just to be sure that they do enough studies and uh, maybe there's a traffic light that's needed there or some something. So that's our main concern. Otherwise, we're very excited about it. So. Okay. Thank you very much. And I believe the IMP did address the streets on both sides of that and the possibility of a, of a lighted intersection. Okay. Right. And I would ask Chris Como or Chris Cook to um, answer that question more specifically. So basically the question is, how does the IMP deal with the, the, the traffic on both sides, the other two sides of, of the proposed residential area? Good afternoon. I mean, good evening, Council. Afternoon. <laughs> um, the IMP document does uh, talk about this area, and um, here I'll use the uh, cursor here. This is the area of uh, we're talking about um, coming right up the east edge here. And uh, as a new street system comes up uh, and intersects Kellogg Road here, um, we would want to take a look at what kind of traffic might be generated from any development in here. Access is going to be an issue because Kellogg Road right here would create the fourth leg of an intersection. It's already essentially set up for that. But without some kind of a traffic signal, we'd have to turn restrict the, the intersection there. So. The best solution is to try to put a traffic signal in here if and when it's warranted. Okay. Does anybody else want to come forward for the public hearing? Seeing none, I'll go ahead and bring the meeting, the hearing to a close. Gene mm. or mm. Gary, questions? Yeah. Or? Well, I actually attended the school with no walls out at uh, uh, Boulevard Park. I took an art class <laughs> out there and I really had to hunt for the main office, which was Oh, I don't even know where it was then to find it, but I also had served on Western's Institutional Master Plan Committee when they were, when there were concerns from the neighborhoods about Western extending into the residential neighborhoods. So I was really happy to see the outreach that was done with this plan with the neighborhoods because that's so important to to get the neighborhoods on board with these ideas that you're, you're going forward with. So that said, I would uh, vote, uh, recommend, I would move to approve the institutional master plan. Second. We have a motion before us to approve the institutional master plan. Is there any further discussion? If I actually have a few questions. Gene? Well, you would have a few yes. questions. Yes. That's okay. Mm -hmm. um, I'll go a step further. I attended Watt Community College when it was across the street from Marine Drive Market. That was a little building, and you're talking 1981. That's where I registered for there the class. There you go, yeah. That was <laughs> unbelievable how it's changed, and I'm glad you're in our community. You helped with all the other institutions we have here, so thank you. Roxanne? 
Well, I recognize that this was a requirement. I hope it was a healthy procedure to go through, and I hope it's, assuming we might support it, that it's a good story you can tell to the community and a good story you can convey to the students to show them how much you care about their values. You know, we really appreciate you as the higher education institution in our community, so I'm going to be happy to support this. Thank you. April? I'm interested in the, it said there's, there's been a number, maybe just a few um, vehicle accidents uh, where pedestrians and vehicles have come Kellogg. together on Kellogg. So I'm wondering kind of the number and the average and then, and, and my concern is that Cordata Parkway, of course, is going to be, I think is actually busier. And we're talking about putting buildings across the street, especially housing. And I think the housing had 245 spaces. And although the gentleman said 225 beds, the booklet says 300 beds I think it's great to have student housing it's just I, I know that there's been a lot of talk having been out to the college about Kellogg and being quite a problem trying to get students back and forth and now we're talking about doing it across um, across Cordata Parkway as well so other than lights and trying to make sure students are crossing where they're supposed to because I think that's been almost all the incidences where the students are not crossing where they're supposed to or they're distracted with media what, is, what are the thoughts on that? I think Chris Como can respond to that, and I could follow up, too. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Kellogg Road was uh, the subject of quite a lot of attention and study in the IMP, and um, essentially where it lies right now is the college uh, clearly has a desire to see um, some kind of a different situation there. However, if we were to, for instance, remove Kellogg Road as a link through the campus, it affects the entire transportation system surrounding the campus as well as the Cordata neighborhood. So we're very um, concerned about this. Um, the college is basically going to be required to continue to look at it and study it. Um, if a proposal is made to do anything along those lines, we'll have to look at the entire situation to find out what the cause and effect is of doing something like that. Uh, in terms of your question about the pedestrian vehicle collisions, yes, there has been a few. Um, we certainly don't want to see that. The city has been working with the community college to enhance all of the crossings out here. In fact, I believe uh, we just installed, or the college just installed some flashing uh, Rectangular Rapid Flashing Beacons, our RFBs. <laughs> Get used to that. We'll be putting some more in in the city. Um, on Kellogg Road, and, and specifically to try to make it safer, call more attention to drivers going through here. Another issue with um, dealing with Kellogg here is, of course, um, the transit function and how do we continue to provide transit. We've got a roundabout on the east side of Kellogg. Kellogg provides a major east-west connection for the entire Cordata neighborhood, and so it's a really big deal. We'd, we'd very much like to make this section of Kellogg as safe as possible, and we'll continue to work with the college to do that. If Does that just, answer your question? Let me follow up on that just for a sec, too, because while we have a concern that's expressed, this isn't um, carte blanche to proceed with development. Subsequent development that's not exempt from SEPA, which is virtually all the major buildings they showed, would be assessed at the project level, and the cumulative effects would be assessed. So any future development that came through, we'd be looking for a traffic study, we'd be evaluating these issues, and we'd have to find mitigating measures to condition it before they could proceed. So. Um, I think what the master uh, the uh, master plan does is identify the issue, frames it, gives us time to work to resolve it, but it does put a um, significant hurdle that needs to be cleared before we can issue another uh, building permit for anything substantial. So processes have not been suspended, um, but this does sort of set the stage for us to consider it. Dan? Um, just in looking at the future build out here, um, it's, well, it's, not, it's not up here, but building 11 and 10, which would be on the uh, northern part of the, of the area, kind of behind the Kelly building, um, those, there's a parking lot there that has, if I recall correctly, about 1,100 parking spaces, and there's a new call for a new parking lot there at building 11 um, on, on Stewart Road. So my question's 
would be how, with consideration of the development that's going in uh, on June Road, how the egress will occur. June goes to Aldrich, Aldrich goes to Northwest, and right now there's a kind of a dangerous uh, left-hand turn onto Northwest off of Aldrich, and then Eliza goes to Bakerview, um, and you know traffic just stacks up there um, during critical times. So I'm just wondering how that's going to be handled. Um, you know, Chris, you brought the, some of the pedestrian crossings. I'm, I'm wondering if um, uh, there'll be any enhancement at Westerly and if there's going to be anything um, on June Road as well for pedestrian. So traffic and pedestrian flow. I'll start on that. Um, again, we're at sort of the 30,000 foot level with the master plan. It says these are roughly the locations and the kind of uses we wish to envision, but it doesn't abrogate the uh, need to do subsequent study. Um, what it does, uh, as we look at that under SEPA and environmental review for each of these projects, we're, we're required to look at that cumulative effect on the entire street, uh, the road net. So essentially, um, typically public works, and Chris can speak more uh, on point to that, would identify those downstream intersections and talk about the contribution of any con uh, new construction towards those. And then there would be mitigating measures or requirements that would need to be put in to address it. Chris, you might want to talk more about how traffic studies would um, allocate trips, platoon it, and look downstream. Well, Rick <clears throat> touched on it. Um, we will be keeping our eye on this area, of course, Cordata and um, the Bakerview area are some of the fastest growing parts of Bellingham. And we have quite a few projects already in the six year tip that we're programming funding for and, and will be going to construction on uh, next year including a, a roundabout um, right up here at Cordata and Stewart. Um, and then the questions about where traffic is stacking up, certainly those are places we're going to be keeping our eyes on. But at some point, we have to recognize that there's going to be more traffic congestion. And there's not a lot we can do about that in terms of making it less congested, except to try to encourage other ways to get around. Certainly there's an opportunity here with the college um, from a transit standpoint, parking management standpoint. We're building out our pedestrian and bicycle networks, and that's all going to hopefully help the situation, but it's a very busy part of town. Thanks. And the tip that Mr. Como referred to is our transportation improvement uh, program, which is a citywide transportation planning and improvement um, document. Um, I'm going to take a question. It also has to do with, with streets, but I don't, I don't think it's actually one for you, Chris. Um, Section 7. Se yeah, Section 7, Part 7C says in no case should right of way widths be less than city minimum requirements. What are the applicable rights of way? Kellogg goes through there. Is any other street, or Lane maybe, subject to this right of way minimum city requirement rule? Or is that the only street really in the district? Can you cite the section you're Sure, is it uh, Section 7, Part 7. That's on page 73 of the packet. Okay. Uh, I'll ask Chris Cook to address sure. that. Sure. It just says in no case should right away widths be less than city, seven, minimum city yeah. requirements. I'm just wondering, is there any other length of road other than Kellogg and the ones in the periphery to which that applies? Not that I'm aware of. Um, Okay, that's, that's, thank that is, you. And the reason why I say this is that the, I, I really don't want the internal streets to be held to what are sometimes overly large requirements. Those internal streets shouldn't be 80-foot rights-of-way kinds of things. So that's, that's good to hear. I also have a question on the previous page. That's Section 6 on parking. 6.1a says parking lots should not encircle buildings. And they are discouraged adjacent to streets and should be minimized when they're located between street and the building. I'm looking at the plan and I see three new buildings planned, one of which is completely surrounded by parking and two of which are also have large parking lots between them and the streets. Which governs, the language or the proposed map? The language governs. The, the map was a exercise in massing and determining you know, potential build out. It's not an exact plan for where buildings are actually going to go, especially for the brand That's new correct. buildings. Okay, I'm just going to suggest that, that the layout of the buildings on the lot may not conform with that section. Right. Mm -hmm. April? 
So we often hear from people who uh, live around Western, how come when they did their master plan, did we not demand more housing be built? And I think this is an opportunity to learn a little bit on what we can and cannot demand for a college in a master plan. Uh, in the housing, it says, should housing be accommodated off campus location, this area, which was for housing number four, um, could be used for non-academic support or secondary academic functions. So, I mean, certainly there could be housing there, but there's, they're also leaving the opportunity that they might not be producing housing. So what is a council if, if is it, because I get the question all the time and I don't know, is that something that we can demand of a college is that they have to produce housing? I'm assuming not. But since I get it all the time, it's a great time for you to address it. Boy, if I might take a stab at that, um, we don't have a regulatory construct for a non-residential school, primarily a non-residential school, to require on-campus housing. Okay. Um, and that would be uh, something that would need to start at the comprehensive plan level and proceed from there. Um, I do think it might be highly problematic, it's certainly in this circumstance, because the vast majority of the students are, are not resident. That's the nature of a community college, though they can't have dorms, others do, um, but it was always a smaller percentage. Um, the linkage between an educational facility and housing is one that's hotly debated. And uh, it would require uh, some study, and then the establishment of a policy based in the comp plan, and then establishment of subsequent regulations uh, in zoning that could be enforced. And we would have to link it, link it to studies that show the public interest was served by providing the housing. I appreciate you clarifying that. Sure. Thank you. If I could add one thing, it's my understanding, and maybe Whatcom can, can um, confirm this, that they have uh, designated, uh, they have arrangements with surrounding apartment complexes for st that are specific to student housing. So some is provided. Okay, any further discussion? We have a motion before us to approve the institutional master plan from Whatcom Community College to become part of our city's comprehensive plan. I, I just like to say I think it's a really orderly, thoughtful, forward-looking document, and I truly love the student housing component. And if, if they don't build it as student housing, I'm going to suggest that they just build it as housing housing. Um, any further discussion on the motion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you very much. That terminates or that ends that hearing. We'll now go on to our second hearing of the evening. is a public hearing on the 2017-2018 revenue projections, including an increase in the property tax as part of our uh, annual budgeting exercise. One of the things we do is we do forecasts on uh, revenues and we look at our property tax revenues and consider changes to our property tax rate as part of our budgeting process. Our finance director is Mr. Brian Henshaw. And whenever you're ready. Thank you. Uh, Brian Henshaw, City of Bellingham Finance Department. Um, I'm here really just to introduce Forrest Longman, who joined the city just in ju uh, July of, of this past year, and he will be presenting uh, the 2017-2018 revenue forecast and uh, opening the public hearing tonight, but will re remain open for the next two weeks, and we'll take written comments all the way until the 13th, just for information. Thanks, Brian. So yeah, uh, beginning the 2018 revenue forecast, will be a brief overview of, of the forecast. We're gonna look in more detail at the general fund, the property tax levy, and then briefly look at uh, the other funds and the budget schedule going forward. So here we see our citywide budget revenue for 2017 and 2018. It's uh, $527.5 million. Uh, the budget has built in an assumption of 2% increase in overall tax revenues, including about 1% increased property taxes. In general, revenues are meeting or slightly ahead of expectations, but we're only nine months into a 24-month cycle, so we're taking a conservative approach to this because many things could happen. <clears throat> Getting into the general fund in a little more detail, so overall we're assuming a 2.4% increase in the general fund revenues into 2018 for $78.6 million. As you can see in the graph, there's basically four major revenue streams for the general fund, sales tax, property tax, utility taxes, and B&O taxes, and we're gonna look at those all in a little more detail. <clears throat> Starting with the B&O tax, business and occupation tax revenue is up 2.5% this year, and we are projecting it to be 3.3% on top of that for next year, which is pretty typical growth 
for this tax, it's 16 million in 2018. Utility B&O taxes, we're expecting a combined 16.9 million in 2018. Uh, overall increase of 3% in both years. Growth in this is, is generally from rate increases, utility companies, or new customers. And a little further breakdown, here you can see where they, how that specific tax breaks down into its parts. Uh, telephone tax uh, continues to decline as people forego landlines, and we expect Back that trend to keep on going. This year, for the first time, uh, seen some decline in revenues for the cable utility taxes, uh, which may be the beginning of a trend for cable cutters. We'll have to wait for another couple years to see how that keeps panning out, but we'll keep an eye on that. And then looking at city citywide sales tax, we're currently on track to end slightly over budget and projecting. $23.7 million in revenue in 2018. The trend has been positive, good year to date. However, um, much of it's buoyed through construction and we're starting to see some permit activity slow, so we're approaching that considerably. We'll look at that in a little more detail. Here we have our top eight sales tax producers by industry. You can see here we've got vehicles and here we've got construction. Construction is about 25% over last year. Vehicles about 22%. Both of those obviously are being held up by macroeconomic interest rates and other things we don't have a ton of control over. And then construction, looking at even more detail, this is construction as a percent of our total retail sales. And you can see here we're starting, we've got construction accounting for almost 16% of our total retail sales, which is higher than it even was in 2006. So as we're starting to see permits taper off a little bit, we would expect this to come down and again, makes us keep a conservative outlook on sales tax revenues. It's not so dramatic that we would expect anything horrible to drop out. We're still projecting growth just at a slightly slower rate. Moving on to property tax. This shows the total property taxes citywide, projecting 1.2% increases over both years for a total of 25 million in 2018, excuse me. The long-term average property tax is about 1.5%, so we're right on track for what we'd expect here. Getting into more detail there, we don't know the final property tax levy amounts for 2018 yet, but this graph shows what the 2017 share was for each jurisdiction. Let's see, school district is 40%, the state general fund is around 20%, the county 9.5%, and the city accounts for 22% of residents' tax bills. This, we don't know what it's going to be for 2018, but we do know that this distribution will change slightly due to uh, the McCleary Agreement that's going to raise the state tax rate and the Hearst decision that's going to shift uh, uh, lower assessed values in the county and, and shift some tax burden into the city. So here's looking at the 2017 levy in a little more detail. Again, this is this year, so just uh, its parts. $14.7 million to the general fund. Greenways producing 4.9. Affordable housing levy for 3 million. The police and fire pension 2.1. And the RDA lift, which is a financing mechanism for the waterfront area at 51,000 for a total of 24.7. And so we are recommending that 1% increase to the property tax levy as allowed. Uh, again, we don't have the final numbers, so this is just an estimate. <clears throat> and these calculations will likely change, but we're estimating the 1% increase is $247,000 added to it for a total of 25 for a home assessed at $370,000, which we're using as the median, va median value we're expecting that would be about $925 a year. And that is uh, because assessed values are up, that would not be an increase in property taxes for a home of that assessed value year over year. Or perhaps a very small one, but not significant. <clears throat> so now shifting to the rest of the city revenues, these are 
a combination of all the non-general fund revenues, so $181 million in 2018. The largest share is the green here, that's uh, utility fees, which total $52.7 million. Grants and other capital-based revenues are pretty volatile here, so that's why you don't really see much of a trend, because we're always getting different amounts of grants or selling bonds or things like that. And the one sort of more discretionary part of that is the real estate excise tax. This is revenue collected from the sale of real estate and is totally dependent on the housing market here. And uh, we've, we're expecting 3.8 million this year, which is a little above what we were projecting. And we're just gonna assume that that's gonna stay at 0% for next year because we don't not have any confidence to project anything different than that. And looking at the major enterprise fund revenues, um, we expect the base revenues for the major enterprise funds to be close to projections and remain relatively stable. You can see here we've got in red, street fund, blue is the water fund, light blue, wastewater, green storm water, and yellow is the solid waste. This spike in the water fund here of revenues, this is the $12 million of state loan that we were supposed to get that's currently held up in the uh, state capital budget. We are still expecting slash hoping to get that, so we're keeping that in there. You can see solid waste goes up a little bit in 2018, and that's from MOTCA funds that we're hoping to get out of the state capital budget. But other than that, things should stay close to trend. And that's about it for the revenue forecast, just checking in on the budget calendar key dates. We worked on it today. We'll, the uh, property tax ordinance needs to be approved by November 30th and to, the, or, and to the county assessor by then. So we'll be introducing it at the next meeting. And at that time, uh, yeah, and then the written comment will stay open until the 13th. We'll have another bu budget work session at the next meeting and then the budget will aim to have passed before the end of the year. And any questions? Gene. Just a real quick one. Could you go back to the proposed 1% property tax increase yes. for a minute? Because I know the Oops. first phone call I'm going to get when I get to work. Yeah. Is the city levy on a $370,000 home, $925,000, $925 is not what each homeowner is going to pay for that, right? Correct, yeah. That's, that's just, that's the just city, what we're taking in. That's just the city's portion. That's so, correct. Yeah. yeah, just for people watching, if they see that, they're going to see city levy on 375925 I understand what yeah. you're saying, but yeah. thank you for that clarification. Sure. Yeah. That's an important clarification. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Terry? What is the current city's tax uh, uh, rate on property taxes? What rate? Did you know that of your hand? Per thousand, I think it's two point uh, two dollars and twenty cents. I think off the top of my head. Um, so we. So you're asking for a one percent increase. So yeah. it's is there a per percentage that? Well, that, that it. That the tax. We don't set the rate. We set the amount. That's right. So the the city sets the total amount of dollars to levy. So a one percent mm -hmm. will be two hundred forty-seven, and it depends what the overall assessed value is on how that's distributed as a rate. Okay, so it's a 1% increase across the board over the amount that's Tax currently rate. being assessed on all tax yeah. on homeowners. Correct. So the estimate is based on $24.8 million there in dollar terms. We increase that 1% and then the assessor's assessed valuation, you divide mm. the dollars by the assessed valuation and that's how you get to the levy rate. So we showed it in okay. just dollars here. Okay. I mean, basically with... Um, land prices and housing rising up, up, up. Our levy rate it keeps going down, 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 but that keeps the number oh. flat or slightly rising. That's correct. correct. Okay. Any further questions? The amount questions? of taxes paid doesn't go down, down. No, down. Tax, oh. taxes that's paid the, go up one percent. That's the big problem. With <laughs> the taxes paid yeah. will go up one yeah. percent. Any further? Pinky. I'm just wondering if we could take what uh, Jean asked one step further to give people an idea they're not paying the $925, but an estimate on our monthly bill is a lot lower than that. What is it, about a couple dollars? What? Well, the increase per month? Or year, like in total, because you see that $925, and, I, and like Jean was saying, I think most people think that's what they're going to pay. 
So nine dollars. That's the total amount for the just the city's portion. So yeah, it will be much higher, but it depends on where the house is and <clears throat> what taxes are assessed. Nine hundred twenty-five dollars. It's nine dollars and twenty-five cents. We don't even pay that a year on. That's just that's just the one percent. Yeah, I'm saying that, that's, that's what one percent is. Thank you. That's what I was looking Sorry. for a clarification, so people don't think they're paying an extra thousand dollars a year. Okay, those are really important clarifications. Um, should we go ahead and start the public hearing? Yeah. Why not? Okay, could you please check, uh, Mr. Longman, and see if anyone signed up for the public hearing? Kelly signed up. I signed up. Kelly signed up. <laughs> Is that allowed? Actually, Kelly, would you like to say something first? Or? Huh? You want to say something right now? Or? Yes, I do. Please, Kelly. Okay. Um, I think I you need it. to. St the, the overall, Brian, why don't you why don't you say this instead of me because I don't want to mess up, but. What, what? The 1% levy is <laughs> that total citywide, $247,000 citywide over everybody's increase in tax. And then it's spread over more people as more people have properties. So I just, it, I mean, that's not. Yeah, we're, a we're lot. trying to put the 1% in perspective. And so over the entire city budget, it's $247,000. So inflation is less or greater than 1%. It doesn't keep up with the cost of living. It doesn't keep up with the cost of goods that we do each year. So that's why we're proposing that we do take the levy of 1%, and that would be 247000 spread across all of the city property assessed valuation. Anybody signed up? Okay, so nobody's signed up, but I'll go ahead and open the public hearing anyway. This is the public hearing on the revenue projections. So as we ex uh, might have explained, or maybe I didn't, uh, we're uh, talking about the spending uh, side of our budget right now. This is a hearing on our revenue projections. Is there anyone who'd like to come forward and speak to the revenue projections for the city's budget? We turned you all off, right? It's really wonky and... The numbers are upside down. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close the, um, sir, up there. You can press that button and speak from up there if you'd like. Like that? Yes. Great. Thank you. Well, I'm excited to see uh, business as usual tonight. I r rode my bike. I hope it's still there after the meeting. Um, we're bringing in more money every year, bringing in more money. Good job, everybody. Um, but despite more money coming into the city, um, property crime is really up, and I hope that some increase in spending is going to be addressed to this issue of property crime. I'm sure it's touched many people in this room, and I don't see very much action happening on the part of the city to address it. When you call the Bellingham Police Department, they f tell you to fill out an online form. They're not going to investigate it. It's no wonder in cities our size that property crime goes underreported by as much as 50%. And our current property crime is as high or higher than some other large cities. And congratulations on bringing in more and more tax money. If you think those property taxes and those levy amounts are fair for citizens, then I hope you also realize that protecting us and our property around the city in public places is also important because business as usual has not been taking care of the problem. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. And for your record, could you state your name? Sure. My name is Jim Larrison. I live in Columbia. Thank you, Jim. Mm -hmm. Would anyone else like to come forward and speak to the projected revenues for the city's budget? Okay. Seeing that, I'll bring the, um, the um, verbal part of, of the... Um, public hearing to close. Uh, we will keep the um, hearing open for written comment for, was it two weeks or three? Okay, so for the next three weeks, we'll keep the, the uh, written, the hearing open for written comments so you can send them to the city anytime uh, before then. Okay, are we through with that? Any further discussion? I think it might be an opportunity to explain the structural, and maybe just really shortly, the structural issues with our budget where our revenues, um, our, I guess our expenses are outpacing our revenues. So it, it's easy to make an assumption that we're going to be taking in all this money and now we're going to have all this new money to do something with, but we're actually, it's that spending into a deficit and, and maybe to help, help people understand a little bit that that's just not all brand new money into the city that we, we're just going to find something new to do with. 
Okay. Um, so this is one of the state requirements that we hold two public hearings a year, and that is why it is just on the revenue. So we'll state that first. Um, the second public hearing will be on the actual budget. Um, and because we do a biennial budget, we will just be the it's the mayor's proposed changes to the biennial budget, which will add both revenues and expenditures. All of this information is online. And um, what April is, is alluding to is the budgeted deficit for the general fund is $6 million over this biennium. So any and all revenue that comes in above budget for the general fund will go to reducing um, the expense, the budgeted expense um, first and foremost. Um, and that's also money that we use for one-time projects. So um, that would be reserves that could also be spent there. But the biennium budget has a $6 million deficit in it um, for the two years. We are trending slightly ahead over the nine months, as Forrest said, but not enough to make a significant dent in that. Um, and then also with uh, municipal governments, most of our expenditures, if they're not spent, continue on. So at the end of the biennial, we will come back to council with another proposed budget. And some of those projects are just due to timing, like the state budget, capital budget, when it's delayed, all the projects become delayed. So some of that will turn into the 19 and 20 budget, but it continues to just be a running total and an estimate at the end of 2018 for where we'll end up. But it is a, a current budgeted deficit. Thank you. Does that help? Okay, you're yeah. finished with that. We'll now carry. I just want to make one statement about this as we think about this going through in the future, and that's we do see housing prices, as was mentioned, escalating really high in a lot of areas. But unfortunately, a lot of people that own many of the homes have been there for a while, plan on staying there, and are on fixed incomes. So what they're seeing is their taxes increases going up, up, up on that same property value. Their income flatlining, pretty much. And so I think we need to always we need to keep that in mind as we're looking. I know it's one percent. It's this. But each time it's this, and the school district's increase is this, and the state's increase is this, and this and this. And for those on fixed income, it becomes, it's becoming, and I'm hearing from different people about that. That's the reason I bring it up. Now they don't come to public hearing. No one comes to public hearings on these for whatever reason, but they come to others and say, you know, man, Terry, I, I'm having a hard time paying these taxes. Is there going up. My house prices are going up, but it doesn't do me any good because I'm not moving. So I just want people to keep that in their minds as we consider this. Okay. We're going to go forward now to the 15-minute public comment period. This is your time to come forward. You will have three minutes to state your name and, and let us know what's on your mind. Uh, at the beginning of the meeting, we had some kind of rules up on the board. Basically, they're just rules of, of civil discourse. Uh, please be polite. Please direct uh, your, your comments not to individuals but to the council as a whole. Um, and also, please refrain from referring specifically to any candidate or, or election measure. It's a violation of state law for us to deal with election issues here. Um, we have three people signed up uh, to speak uh, today. First one is Valerie Wade and followed by Shannon Campbell. So, Valerie, if you'd like to come forward to the microphone as soon as there's a little bit of room for you. I'd have to leave it there. All right. <laughs> Hi, I'm Valerie Wade. I'm the owner of the Wild Bird Chalet. Sent you all a letter. Um, I've had the Wild Bird Chalet for 10 years. I've been a Bellingham resident for 30. Um, I talked to Mark Gardner last week, and we talked about the wording of the ordinance uh, about banning wildlife. Uh, he, he said he would talk to the city attorney, talk to Michael Lilliquist changed the wording to include bird feeding, mm -hmm. which was good. So I got into it more doing research. I talked to Parks Department. I talked to Public Works. I talked to uh, State Department of Fish and Wildlife. What I wanted to know is uh, where's the sources that are specific to us? This is not a good ordinance because 
it doesn't deal with the fundamental problems, which are we have more growth, we saw that, and more construction, and we've got less places for wildlife. A lot of people like to live here because it's beautiful and it's a little wild. And so we have to get along with our wild neighbors. We also don't have predators here to deal with animals that normally would have predators like deer and raccoons. We need to address those issues because we're only going to get more crowded here. The other issue I have with this ordinance is that there's, no, there's not going to be any enforcement. There's no one to do it. No organization has the money. The staff, the police don't want to do it. The Humane Society won't do it, can't do it, doesn't have the money. The State Department of Fish and Wildlife will come out for a complaint, but they won't cite. So we're, we're talking about passing an ordinance that has no enforcement, which I think is not a good thing to tell people, because it tells people it doesn't matter. There's no punishment. So I would like to, from my perspective, because I talk to people about this all the time, and I don't encourage people to feed deer and raccoons. I don't think it's a good idea. It, it, it's, it's dangerous in some ways. But people like wildlife, and we need to educate them about how to get along, what to do and what not to do. We need to give them incentives to behave well and make it a bigger community agreement. At the very last, we make a law that says, we're going to punish you if you don't do this. Not now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Valerie. Shannon, Shannon Campbell, you're up next. Uh, good evening. Thank you for the time to speak. I'm also speaking in regards to the uh, prohibi uh, prohibition of feeding deer and raccoons as well. My opposition is that I think the legislation is just too hasty. Uh, it was written poorly originally, which similar to what got Valerie involved in it, uh, examining it further was the fact that it mentioned nothing about bird feeding. And that was the alarm for me. So I started digging more into it as well. The, the first thing I thought about was, do we need a law? Before we start legislating to fix problems, we need to determine if the problem actually exists. And the one-sided data in the memo that was sent to you that um, encouraged the law was the citation of a study that was done um, on one golf course on the Iberian Peninsula in Spain on two deer species that we don't even have here. So that was my first thought was, wait, that's not our problem, that's Spain's problem, not even Europe and North America, but not, certainly not Bellingham. Um, so ex it, 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 removing that source that was cited, it then I noticed in the meetings came to uh, the council's memories as well as mayor's, and that didn't even jibe with each other. There was some conflict as to if there really is a problem with the deer population, and I would just caution that I know you get a lot of complaints about the problems in these specified areas that are not citywide, but just pockets, um, according to what I saw in the meetings. Uh, so I would encourage that you consider if there really is a citywide problem that demands legislation that's going to be citywide, or do we examine the pockets of the complainers? And also creating legislation that's not got an enforcement agency assigned is not going to necessarily help with you not receiving the, comp, uh, the complaints from those areas as well. It sounds like since they're in particular areas of the city, you have a neighbor problem, not a deer problem. And legislating whether or not deer or raccoon are actually being fed, which nothing about data for raccoons was even mentioned, but so I guess they were tossed in, I'm not sure. But it sounds like we have a neighborhood problem. And just getting something on the books doesn't necessarily help with mediating the neighbor problems that we have. Um, and as anyone knows who has dealt with the police, you don't need a law on the books for police, uh, Whatcom Humane Society, or Department of Fish and Wildlife to have a conversation or mediate between two neighbors. There doesn't have to actually be a law broken. A neighbor can just be not getting along with another neighbor, and it just needs a mediation. So I, I would just request that you target more toward education, like the Scoop the Poop campaign. That was 
raising awareness. It's helped me, certainly, with scooping mine. Dogs, my dogs. Um, but I would just encourage education before legislation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who would like to come forward? Okay, we'll go ahead and bring the public comment period to close. We'll go on with our reports from our uh, committee meetings. Um, first committee which met this afternoon was Public Works and Public Safety. Terry Borneman, can we have your report? Thank you, Michael. Uh, we had one item for the committee today, and that was an extension of the lease term for the Bellingham Railroad Museum. For the past 14 years, the Bellingham Railroad Museum has been leasing approximately 2,400 square feet uh, in the Commercial Street Parking Building for $560 per month. This monthly payment is currently about 70% less than market rate. The lease will expire on January 31, 2018, and the Railroad Museum would like to extend the term of the lease for another three years at the same rate of $560 per month, pursuant to Section 4.8.8-0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.
Um, the Justice Committee is new this year, and I thank the Council for giving um, this body an opportunity to learn a lot more about our systems related to justice. Uh, an opportunity for you all to learn more about that is to visit the City Council website, and you can click on Top Issues. You can find all kinds of information on justice, watch all those, and start to learn like we're learning all those really um, very difficult and uh, moving parts that all have to learn how to work together. So the report was quite broad. Uh, it discussed um, earlier this morning there was a, a report to the Incarceration Prevention and Reduction Task Force. So it gave all of the suggestions for Whatcom County. And when they came here, they gave specific suggestions to Bellingham. And I want to say there's a huge comment. We still have more work to do, but uh, the Vera, they wanted me to make sure that I stated because they had forgotten to that it was a real pleasure to work with the city, that the city bent over backwards to make sure they gave all the information that was possible and, and took suggestions, ran with suggestions before the port was even out. So um, I think that uh, that's commendable. And thank you very much, Peter and Judge Deb Love, of course, the mayor for directing staff to do that, and Darlene Peterson, um, our our court operations person. Um, the three main takeaways that I had were within the city of Bellingham were uh, to ensure that there's counsel present at bail decisions. They did notice that more people were released upon um, personal recognizance if there was somebody present. And uh, I will say that municipal court does, from what the Vera report said, an excellent job Monday through Friday making sure that that's available. There was concern that if you're arrested on a Friday that you might be waiting until a Monday and that that two to three days could have um, lasting impacts that there was there's people that if they're even 24 hours 48 hours if if they're um they actually saw a causation of being actually in a jail and it having long lasting impacts even up to two years which was really interesting so some of these things are important if you are going to work on diversion to make sure that we're diverting people out very quickly so um yay for bellingham for already doing um what was suggested but you know we have more more to do to look at the weekends um, there was it, this interesting research that was shown. Uh, right now we have a financial, a bail system, and there was suggestions to move toward what other um, municipalities and states have done, counties have done more to a risk management. And the suggestion there is if you do a risk man management, you're, you're having the people go out on personal recognizance because they have um, low risk to the community versus on a financial or a jail uh, bail situation. You might have somebody that's a high risk, but they could afford the bail, so they're out in the community. So they were suggesting that um, within communities where they were able to study apples to apples on this, there was a 30 percent um, decrease in pretrial cost to the community because of that that bail system. So it wasn't just you weren't having booking fees and some other things. You were also um, you were also having a far less impact on uh, the person. But then um, Moonwater, uh, she's with the Dispute Resolution Center. She was there this morning before our meeting, and she said, let's all remember that there's those lasting impacts in the community beyond what we can uh, financially state. So um, the last one was, uh, I think, good in, at the county, and, and I'm assuming the municipality will also look at a caseload strategy. And that's a lot more difficult than what I'm going to explain right now. But you can watch all of that again by going to the City Council website and hitting Top Issues. And when you do that, there's we've tried to simplify it so you don't have to go to our meetings and try to find out exactly when this meeting is, where you can go and you can watch all those Justice Committee meetings and one specific one if you like. So um, it was an excellent report. If you're interested in listening to what happened this morning, which was more of a full Whatcom County, you can uh, call either the Whatcom County Council Office or you can go to their website and look at their Incarceration Reduction Task Force and it's all right there. The, the download PDFs as well as the, um, it's just audio. So, and with that, end of committee. Okay, thank you. And the, the video for this afternoon will take a couple of days before it's online. But yeah. The previous committees are there. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. I believe the next committee is Committee of the Whole. Yeah, so Committee of the Whole. I will give out the report from the seven items from the Committee of the Whole. The first item of the Committee of the Whole was a hearing examiner's annual report to the City Council. Once a year, our hearing examiner, uh, as required by our uh, municipal code, reports to the City Council and summarizes the cases she's heard, any lessons learned, and any recommendations she'd like to give. A hearing examiner, Sharon uh, Rice, identified uh, several uh, small issues that were uh, gaps or errors or um, um, 
uncertain parts of our code and suggestions having to do with um, changing the review of a land disturbance permit in Lake Whatcom Watershed to administrative um, um, rather than through the hearing examiner. Um, that the subdivision criteria were actually not stated at all, so she suggested we actually have some criteria for subdivision decisions. She had an issue she decided had to do with whether or not a fee was paid in a timely fashion, and there was no indication of what timely actually meant, and there was a fee waiver if you were indigent, and there was no indication of what indigent meant. So she identified that small issues. Our planning staff will put them on their list of things to correct. Um, but she actually spent the majority of her introductory remarks talking about what she had heard recently, that is in many jurisdictions across Washington State, she was hearing at a meeting, there's a, uh, an appearance, uh, a fairness issue for many hearing examiners, that hearing examiners are sometimes uh, seen as siding with the developers or being on the same side as the staff rather than being independent judicial officials who are supposed to decide based on the written law and apply the facts like a judge does. Um, and she assured us that she uh, takes her independence very seriously and is considering uh, reforms she can do to not only maintain fairness but to make sure that the appearance of fairness is kept up as well. That was just uh, for our information uh, from the hearing examiner. The second item was a resolution setting the dates and times for the 2018 city council meetings uh, this time of year we set all of our meetings for next year so that every single scheduled meeting we'll have is already on the calendar for 2018 um, this afternoon um, we recommended approval of the resolution setting the dates for next year and I so move second any further discussion of the date setting okay all in favor of setting uh, passing the resolution to set the dates for our meetings in 2018 signify by saying aye aye, aye. aye. opposed I also, so that passes 7-0. Um, the next item, the third one, was a minor revision to, revision to an ordinance prohibiting the feeding of deer and raccoons within the city of Ellingham. On October 9th, the Bellingham City Council voted to pass an ordinance prohibiting the feeding of wild deer and raccoons within city limits. Some Bellingham residents have expressed concern the ordinance could be construed to allow enforcement against people for feeding wild birds. Um, this afternoon, the city council amended section F. Uh, to add the word wild birds to make it clear that that's an excluded category of animals that is not to be enforced against. This afternoon, the uh, committee uh, recommended passing the, that ordinance on third and final, so we won't vote on it now. We'll vote on it at the end of the meeting under third and final, at the amended version. Okay. Fourth item uh, was a discussion of our 2018 legislative priorities. We have a legislative agenda that we join with with the city, the port, and the Whatcom County that we take down to uh, Olympia to uh, lobby for for our legislatures. It's a list of, of joint concerns we have with regard to uh, financing and operations. Um, we had the first look at the draft legislative agenda. We gave some feedback. That agenda will now go back to our partners um, here and we'll approve at some later date the final version of that legislative agenda and that will help guide our efforts in Olympia in the coming year. The fourth item was a waterfront district implementation status report. Uh, staff were here to provide an update on projects. The city of Bellingham is leading in the waterfront district in coordination with the Port of Bellingham and the developers selected by the downtown waterfront area, which is Harcourt LLC. Um, and that, uh, so I'll do that part first. So for the uh, city of Bellingham has approved the construction of the first two main arterials in there and the utilities underneath the arterials. We've also approved spending on the uh, first um, waterfront, uh, Whatcom Waterway uh, Park, which we're calling Waypoint Park. Um, that construction will go forward. Um, and then in addition to that, the um, developer has been talking with the port about uh, possible changes to the layout and the, the, the plan this afternoon that was presented to us, what those possible revisions would be, uh, things in there that the uh, staff were seeing as positive elements, uh, both of the old plan and improvements that might be made under the new plan. Uh, however, to make any changes to the sub-area plan for the um, um, Whatcom um, uh, waterfront that has to go through a full legislative process. The port and the developer has to submit materials, which they need to do by April. They may do it before April, but once that's done, there'll be a, a thorough review of any of those changes. There'll be a look through the several governing documents that have to do with the waterfront and any changes that are made to the waterfront planning document would then need to be subject to that public process and to a final vote of the Bellingham City Council sometime next year. Uh, that was is there any further discussion on that item? Okay. 
The sixth item was an interlocal agreement between the City of Bellingham and the Port of Bellingham for Waypoint Park. So that's the waterfront park I just referred to. Uh, the City and the Port are parties to an interlocal agreement for facilities within the waterfront district. Basically, it's an agreement on how we portion up the costs. Under that agreement, the city will pay for the cost of the park, but the development of the beachfront property was a 50-50 share between the port and uh, the city for Waypoint Park. Um, this is an interlocal agreement that sets forth a 50-50 cost-sharing agreement for those beach improvements at Waypoint Park. Based on a bid from Strata Construction on October 9th, this agreement finalizes that cost-sharing agreement with the port on how they will pay for Schedule B, beach work, for a base amount of $154,000, and that also includes a 10% uh, contingency fee for quantity overruns. Uh, in addition, the port will reimburse the city again on a 50-50 basis if there any approved change orders. Uh, this afternoon, the um, Committee of the Whole reckoned approval of the interlocal agreement, and I so move. Second. Okay, any further discussion on interlocal agreement for cost sharing for the beach improvements? Okay, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes 7-0. Our seventh item was a work session on the proposed 2017-2018 biannual uh, budget. So that's the spending aspect of it. Um, we, oh, let me help this. We did library, we did public works, and we did planning and community development. That's right. So those are the three departments that we discussed. They presented their, their work plans for last year, their work plans for the coming year, and any budget changes. Uh, for most of those departments, the changes were very small. For public works, they were actually very large, and it has to do with the large projects that the uh, public works does. And some of those large budget changes also include large new revenues. For example, we're getting a $2.9 million grant from American Rivers Foundation, and we'll be spending that $2.9 million. So that's a big budget adjustment. In addition, the Clean Air, Northwest Clean Air Agency is giving us a grant of $760,000 for solar panels, and so our budget has to show the increase in revenue and then $760,000 of increased spending. Most of those solar panels will probably go on the water treatment plant and then other uh, rooftop buildings too for the city of Bellingham. Um, that was just for discussion. Um, now we'll go on to um, uh, any further discussion on the budget. We'll have more uh, budget meetings in the future before we approve the budget. Um, Minutes for approval. We have one set of meeting minutes from October 9th. Move approval. Second. It is right, isn't it? Yeah, they're here somewhere. Okay. Um, we have a motion before us to approve the meeting minutes. Is there any changes to the meeting minutes? Okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Items under old or new business. Dan. I uh, just wanted to thank. Um, our neighborhood patrol officer, Dante Alexander, for taking me on a, a ride along last week. Uh, very eye opening uh, to see what happens uh, for those um, evening shifts in our community. So thank you. Anything else under old new? April? Uh, it's, it's a meeting for the Library Board of Trustees on October 26th at 4.30 p.m. Uh, upstairs in the library. Any council members that would like to attend are public. Um, they, there was a presentation by the Burke Institute on a sustainability plan. Uh, now they're going to be formulating, I guess, their recommendations or what they would like to bring forward to council. So October 26th at 4.30 p.m. in the library. Okay, under old business, uh, a couple weeks ago, the uh, council here asked me to uh, go across the street, talk with our county council members on the issue of dealing with homeless issues and the homeless shelter issue. Um, on, I did indeed talk to uh, uh, members of the leadership over there, and on the tomorrow's meeting, there is a resolution being introduced to uh, set up a strategic work group uh, that, that the uh, county council is setting up, and on that uh, work group, it would include representation, uh, the mayor or her designee, and city council members. Great. Um, so stay tuned for um, what that will be. Okay. Anything else under old and new business? Okay. Moving right along, I believe next is um, report out from executive session. In the executive session, we had two items. Both of them were property acquisitions. Um, staff provide information on a potentially property acquisition, and I would entertain a motion to authorize the purchase of an eight-acre watershed parcel from Charles Evans for $160,000 with an anticipated closing date on, in November of this year. So moved. Second. We have a motion before us to purchase uh, this property in the watershed. This is part of our watershed acquisition program, basically to prevent development of the watershed where it might harm water quality. 
Um, all those in favor of authorizing this property acquisition signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That passes 7-0. And the second one is very similar. There's also a property acquisition in the watershed also for water quality protection. This one is actually even closer to uh, the shore of the lake. The other one was kind of boarded two streams. I would entertain a motion to authorize the purchase of 0.88 acres of watershed parcel from uh, Mark Schlichting for eighty thousand dollars. We anticipate a closing date again in November of this year. I so move. Second. I don't know who moved that one. I'll give it to Terry. Okay, Terry moved that one. Uh, any further discussion of this? All those in favor of the property acquisition, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Um, mayor's report. Kelly. Uh, three comments, four comments, and then I have some um, information only appointments. Uh, the first one is um, I just want to emphasize how important it is on our legislative agenda to focus on the capital budget. I think you've heard the effect it has on our ability to do our capital projects. And even though we're hopeful um, uh, and we have some reserves we could use, it's still uh, sets us back when we have to use our own money when we've been successful at getting uh, included in the capital budget. There was um, a comment from Senator Erickson last week at a small cities meeting about potentially passing a budget early uh, because of the fact that there's going to be a, an election and potentially that might change how many votes there are for a Hearst decision in a capital budget. Um, also, the idea that as they go into 18, there might be some other projects. So I've asked Ted <clears throat> um, Carlson to start looking at potential projects, public works projects that potentially we could put on the on the capital budget, uh, new capital budget. Um, I was going to hand this out, and I think I'll still wait till the budget meeting next time. Um, Michael and I and Roxanne were at the WTA meeting and one of the things that they showed was the reserves based on fund, so general fund reserves that the, well, that WTA had. Well, we've done one with w, uh, the general fund and the dedicated funds and I'm going to reinforce something that Terry said. Um, I have been concerned about our, our level of taxation on the people in our community. I don't think that the 1% property tax um, is exorbitant when we go through that, but then we have a host of other um, assessments that we make, and I would really like to have that discussion after the first of the year with the council about all the different ways that we're collecting money, and may there, might there be a different way to do it that would make more sense, because it would give us more flexibility to fund our priorities every two years and it would also potentially give us the opportunity to reduce uh, some of the tax burden. Now you saw the chart and the school district is 40 percent so um, many you know and and then the state and the county um, we are not the highest uh, portion of property tax but we do do a lot of other taxes so I just wanted to raise that as a potential issue and then um, I really, um, I guess I'll say I appreciated the comment about criminal justice. As this council knows, you've hired two new police officers every year that I have been here. And that is a significant investment in the police. And there is still more work to do. So I want to acknowledge the fact that we understand that the officers that we're adding, the resources that we're putting in both fire to fire and police, um, they, they're not enough to take care of every pop problem, but I want to compliment you on supporting those requests because I think it's important that we make progress every year, especially as we go to a preventative, um, reactive form of, of community policing where we try to prevent crime as much as just arrest people. So. Thank you for that. Um, the two appointments I have are to the Mayor's Neighborhood Advisory Commission. 
One is uh, David LeBeau and the other is Pamela Sorensen. And just, it's just for your information. Just a quick question, were those vacant spots? Because I was looking on the roster the other day and I saw some vacancies, are those? Well, David is from Edgemore, and he that was a vacant one. Okay. And Pamela is um, uh, interested in organizing the Meridian neighborhood. Oh, great. That's so good. we have never had a Meridian no. um, neighborhood organization. So there is an issue. It's easy to organize around an issue, and we're going to appoint her now and give both of them a time to get um, their organizations expanded and see if that is representative of what the concerns would be neighborhood wide. April? Yeah, that was my question. I was interested in if it was going to go beyond since we haven't had Meridian organized into a neighborhood association. And it is, I mean, if you look at it on a map, it's be very difficult to figure out what's your center, what's your hub, what's your sense of community. Um, so I would be interested to see how she's going to uh, be reaching out and if the city will be helping her in any way with that because it will be very, it's not like she can just go door to door, maybe along Sterling, but the rest of the neighborhood is going to be pretty difficult to reach out. Um, and then, of course, because we usually, it's the neighborhood association that then uh, um, suggests who they would like they vote on it and then bring it forward. So I'm glad that you're willing to open it up to somebody that isn't coming from a, a foundational neighborhood that's already been put together, but maybe it will get some people interested in starting to advocate for their little piece there. And of course, <clears throat> I always think it's better when a neighborhood association is organized and appoints their own people, but in this particular case, um, the people on MNAC, the other representatives, are very willing to help what has made their organization successful and ideas for her that she can use. And I'm hopeful that it will expand broader than uh, a sub-neighborhood issue, but you have to start somewhere. So I'm perfectly happy to have her try. With that, I'm done. Okay, thank you, Kelly. Consent agenda? Approval. That's a tie. Tie goes to the younger person, Roxanne. <laughs> Roxanne, move the motion. Did you second that then? I'll second. Okay. Um, all those uh, in favor of approving the consent agenda, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously. We'll now move on to our last item of business, which is final consideration of ordinances. <laughs> Elizabeth? Agenda Bill 21715. An ordinance prohibiting the feeding of deer and raccoons within the city of Bellingham. Move third and final. Second. Roll call, please. Terry Borneman? Aye. Dan Hamill? Aye. Jane Knudsen? Aye. Michael Lilliquist? Aye. Roxanne Murphy? Aye. Pinky Vargas? Aye. April Barker? Nay. Ordinance passes. 6-1. Okay, thank you very much. Is there any business before the Billingham City Council? If not, we'll adjourn into our next regularly scheduled meeting. Thanks, everyone.